You see, when we think of garden, what do we think? Flowers, right? This is a typical garden. This is the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus Christ was praying that night of his agony. That's a garden of Gethsemane. Go to the next slide. The next slide, this, this tree here, you can't see it, but it said that tree here is probably the oldest olive tree that could have been over at least a thousand years old, if not standing when Jesus Christ was still there. That olive tree you see there. Because olive trees don't die. If you go do your study on olive trees, they don't die. Olive trees don't die. And, and there we were praying that some of you who are in the crossroad right now, as Jesus Christ prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was at a crossroad, we were praying that if any one of you were in a crossroad in your life, that God's will will be done in your life in 2011 and you would not be the same again because once Jesus went to the cross the Bible said the Lord God gave him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess even that thing that is causing you to fret keep going on keep going on in that area is a church called the All Nations Church, right in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this rock that I'm touching there is the same rock. That's what archaeology says. That's what the Bible guide tells us. That same rock would have been the same rock in the same area where Jesus Christ was praying in the garden. Where the Bible said his sweat was dropping like a blood onto the rock that same rock there would have been there 2000 years ago well rock don't disappear structures can disappear but rocks don't disappear keep going on oh yeah this one here so so this is this is uh, some israeli kids and uh these kids thought i was jay-z or something uh, we, were, we, were, we were in the marketplace we were in the marketplace and they came when they saw me, you know, like they saw me and they came just rushing, rushing at us, rushing at me there. And, and uh, I go, no, 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 I'm not a rapper, I'm a preacher. They go, what's a preacher? I go, you know, like I'm a Christian, I talk about the Bible. And they go, what, what's a Christian? These kids here, God is my witness. They haven't even heard of Jesus Christ. And right there, Mary and I begin, put on to the next one. Mary and I begin to witness to them about who Jesus Christ is and why we are taking this trip keep going oh by the way at the end we, we bless them we bless them we give them some some money and you should see these kids in the marketplace just going crazy like you just won a lot or something and uh, this is the old city wall like the wall we're building here this is the old city wall now not the not the one that Nehemiah built but the, you know after AD 70 the Romans came and what boom keep going you're gonna see it now the Romans came keep going that's still the city wall the w Romans came and they besieged Jerusalem and these ruins according to the guide and the archaeologist are the ruins that stays there still you see those ruins still in Israel in Jerusalem this is the mountain this is the the the, the, uh, uh, the, the mount of uh, the temple mount area these walls are still sitting there there the way it was besieged keep going and then we went to Engedi how many of you remember what happened in Engedi Engedi was when Saul was pursuing and chasing David and David ran to Engedi. Engedi is, a, is filled with caves. Caves where David was running from Saul. And there we were praying for some of you who right now, the enemy is chasing you. That as the enemy chased David, and David found comfort and refuge in the rock of Engedi, that you too will find refuge in the rock of all ages, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was our prayer for you. In there. Keep going on. Keep going on. That's the spring 
See, see, even in the midst of, of calamity and in the midst of, of perplexity, there's always a refreshing place. There's always an oasis. Even in that, you see that spring, it's unbelievable. That's so high. Look, that's somebody standing. You can't probably see it, but that's somebody standing there in red. That's how high that oasis, that fall is as it comes down. And guess what we we're doing at the bottom? Put it up. Oh, sorry, that's uh, just a, a rock badger welcoming us. Put the next one. That's Mary there scooping the water of, of Engedi, the spring of Engedi there. That you can find refreshment in God. Keep going on. Oh. Well, well, well. It wasn't just all free. What, what did you expect? We told you we're going for our 20th anniversary too. So, so, so we put a little romance. We mixed it with a little romance. And uh, okay, so that's what, I'm glad the kids are not here. They would have go, get a room, get a room. Next one, next one. Masada. Masada is a fortress. Masada was the fortress that King Herod built on top of 850 feet above the sea level rock if you know king herod he was a madman king herod was a kind of person who thinks the whole world is chasing him and this guy is so paranoid that he he built he built masada a fortress a, another a, another palace 850 feet above the sea level but guess what happened when the romans came in 1870 they came and they knocked <laughs> they built up a ramp that went up this cliff keep going on see we took um we took um what do you call those things the the cable cable thing we took a cable car up the romans came they built a lift a, a ramp to get up to that for 850 feet above the sea level and they destroyed the fortress at that point I say God if there's anyone in our congregation that is building a fortress around them trying to run from the enemy and thinking that the enemy can bring that fortress down would you make them to realize that there's only one fortress that is impenetrable huh? There's only one fortress that the enemy can never reach. And that fortress is God. Because the Bible said, thank you, thank you, give it to the Lord, give it to the Lord. The Bible said, the Bible said, the Lord surrounds Jerusalem and those who love him as the mountain surrounds Jerusalem. Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. That's the fortress you got to be going running to. Not a fortress, no matter how high it is, 850, the enemy can still get to it. But there's a fortress that you can build around you that is impenetrable. And that fortress is God. That's why the psalmist said, the Lord God is our refuge and our, thank you, our fortress. Let's keep going on. That's still, that's still it there. Keep going, keep going. Okay, let's fast now. Ah, Dead Sea. So Dead Sea is the lowest. You, you, know, you know when people say they've been to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest, right? If you tell me, Pastor Ty, go to the lowest. I've been to the lowest. Dead Sea is the lowest point in earth it's 450 feet below the sea level keep going and 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 one of the things you do in dead sea is you swim so now i've been told now now i've been told i i, I no i wasn't told i've never been able to float in my life never never i could never float because i'm all bones there's no flesh nothing I could never float. Mary can be in a swimming pool and go like that, boom, and she's floating on her back. Me, 
I'll sink. And I've been told, when you go to the Dead Sea, you can float. Anything can float on the Dead Sea because it's so buoyant because of the salt, right? So, so, so I'm trying, I'm going to, this is my day to float. This is my day to float. It's so cold, but I got to float. I got to float. So keep going, keep going. <laughs> I was actually floating. I floated. That's why that man was laughing. I floated for the first time in my life and I made everybody hear it. I floated. Keep going, keep going. You see me with my hands up too. Marion is floating there. Keep going. You see, you see me with my hands up. See, I was actually floating. I go, hallelujah, I floated in the Dead Sea. At that place, we were praying, God, there are people who, the enemy has declared something dead in their lives. But Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we brought a prayer to the next one. Go to the next slide. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I'm going to skip all that. Keep going. Via the La Rosa, we came back to Jerusalem. Keep going. And then we came to the garden tomb. You all remember what happened in the garden tomb? The enemy thought he had kept Jesus Christ dead. Huh. But on the third day, Next one. That's us going into the garden tomb. It's a very small cave. Keep going on. Keep going on. That's the place of the skull. You can see a skull-shaped face there at Golgotha. Keep going on. That's a sign about resurrection. Keep going on. Keep going on. People lining up. Keep going on. At the third day, the Bible says, and the tomb was empty. When we went to the garden tomb, that's where the tomb was. And you see how empty that place is? And we were praying there that God, if there's anyone who feels dead, 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 and the enemy has declared some things dead in their life, that 2011, as they begin to rebuild, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as you rose again from the dead, would you please raise them up? Go, go on, next, next, next. That part there, you can't see it. At the end of the other side there would have been where the feet would have been placed. Buddha's tomb is occupied. Muhammad's tomb is still occupied. Confucius' tomb is still occupied. But Jesus' tomb, oh, I, I, I will never be the same when I went into that place. Keep going on. Keep going on. After that, we got into a chapel, and we were just praising God with communion. That's our group there. About 25 of us went as a group, all from Toronto area. Keep going. The Wailing Wall. This is the Wailing Wall still standing. The Wailing Wall still standing, the only wall that was not broken down at that time in the siege, still standing. People will go there to pray. But this is not just about a wall. This wall here, according to our guide, it tells us the reason why the people are willing and praying there 24-7, 366 days a year, is because this willing wall is the closest part to the holies of holies. That part there would have been where the temple would have been built on that same area, all right, in that same area, but you see that area where people are standing is where the Jewish court is in the old temple. And beyond that would have been the holies of holies where only the priests can enter. But when the temple was taken down, now the closest the Israelites could get to God is through this temple, through this wailing wall. That's why you see them praying and wailing there 365 days a year. And I prayed to God. We went there, we, we spent about 15, 30 minutes praying that God, the people who last year were wanting more, desiring more of you, 
that would you make 2011 even be more year of drawing nearer to you in all things? Because this is the closest they could draw near to God. But guess what? We don't need a wall to draw near to God. God is within us. Amen. Let's go on. Temple Mount, that's Temple Mount, which is now a mosque, by the way. That's uh, the rock of the dome. Keep going on. Oh, that, that little bird is so smart, he opened his own gate. We saw that. We thought, oh, we're going to take a picture of this. Next one. And then that's us in our hotel. Keep going, keep going. I spent too much time in this. Keep going, keep going. Uh, homeward bound. And, uh, and uh, we got back. Wow. It was, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience that made the word of God to come alive. If you, if you have the opportunity in your lifetime and you're healthy and God has blessed you, that's a trip you must take because you'll never be the same. Uh, we were gone, but we were really gone because uh, we missed you guys. Did you miss us? Did you miss us? D did you miss us? I, I just want to say thank you to the Dickens while we were gone that uh, filled in for us. Uh, Jeremy, Kuma, Neil, and uh, thank you to uh, Matthew too for speaking on one Sunday evening. And uh, I'm blessed, I'm blessed that we can go away knowing that you all are taken care of. And that's who God, and that's what God is doing. That's what God is doing in Wilma Heights. And, and I want to thank God for people in this congregation. I know we're loved. I really know we're loved. Would give us the opportunity to go. They say, Pastor Amirian, you got to go for your 20th. We'll go anywhere and we'll take care of your children. Do, do you, do you guys want, we didn't bring our kids with us. Wonder what happened to them? We had three people in this congregation who were house parents for our kids for 14 days that we were away or something like that. Uh, Heidi here and Stan and Lorna help us to take care of our children while we were gone. That's how good. That's how good. And we're singing, Lord, you're good this morning. I know what I'm singing. I don't know how God has been good to you, but God has been good to us. That's how God has been good to us. And we thank you. There's no place like home, I tell you. We had fun, but we couldn't wait to get back. We couldn't. And uh, so we're glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the message quickly. And uh, by the way, that's just a, a snippet of our trip. We took 600, and 600 plus pictures, Miriam took. And I just showed you 40 of that, so you can imagine. And, uh, but we, we've been enjoying a new message series. How many of you are ready for the word now? All right. We've been enjoying a new message series called What Really Matters. And really in life, if you have lived long enough, like I have, <laughs> I'm sounding old now. She, she, Auntie D got that joke. You know that a lot of things may seem important, may look important, may even feel important. But when all is said and done, only a few things in life really matters. Can I get a witness from all of you who have been there, done that, and got the t-shirt too. Amen. See, see, it's like this. It's like this. When my wife Marion asked me to marry her 20 years ago, <laughs> I had to make sure I knew what she was cooking. I need to make sure I knew what she was cooking. If she was the real deal or not. You see, just because some woman comes to me begging me to marry her that doesn't mean I just go and I throw myself at her like that. No way. This, this dude here has got I've, got I've got pride. I needed to make sure that I needed to make sure that I knew what was important to her. 
and what was important to her concerning our relationship. I needed to know what really matters to her. How many times have you heard someone say, if I had known what I was getting into, I never would have said, you've probably said so to yourself. The thing I love, the thing I love about, about our God, the thing I love about God uh, is God never throws a curved ball at us. In our relationship with God, God never pretends to be something today and another thing tomorrow. With God, what you see is what you... Right, 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 right from the get-go, right from the get-go, He lets us know what really matters to Him and what ought to matter to us as we do church together and as we live this life, this thing that is called life, as we live it together, God wants us to know what really matters so we don't go on in life and only to come to the end and feel like we never really lived. In the first message, we saw from scripture that worship matters. Worship matters. Meaning, God is to be first proton in everything. Not just in some things, not just in few things, but He is to be your all in all. Amen? Amen. Then in the second message, we talked about love matters. It, it, really, it, really doesn't, it really doesn't matter how good looking you are like me. and uh, it, it really doesn't matter how much you know and you have a degree and uh, you have a doctor behind your name. and It really doesn't matter how much you know until people know how much you care. I shared with you that people would not reach out to you if they know that you don't love them. Because love matters in everything. God forbid. God forbid. But you go home after the service this morning and tell your wife you don't love her anymore. And you watch the firework begins. Love matters. Today we want to talk about another matter. Today we want to talk about giving matters. Everybody say giving matters. Giving matters. Now, now, some of you didn't say that cheerfully. <laughs> now, now you, you imagine your rich, imagine your rich auntie just died and left you a pile of cash. How happy would you be? Don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me this thing ain't important. So, so I want you to say this with me one more time, but this time I want you to say it cheerfully. Giving matters. Thank you, thank you. I see somebody really smiling there and the person <laughs> beside them. It's so amazing how People can change. Our, our money can change people's attitude so quickly. You hear about money and you see, or you talk about money and you see how people will react. It's unbelievable. This thing here, there's a reason why the Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil. This thing here can make a good person become evil. Can I get a witness? You know, money can just change people's attitude so quickly. It reminds me of a farmer who called a church asking to speak to the, the head hog at the trough. <laughs> and the secretary, the secretary said to the farmer, Sir, if you're talking about our minister, I would have you rather call him the reverend 
or pastor. But I don't think it would be proper for you to call our minister the head hog at the trough. <laughs> well, very well, the farmer said. And uh, the farmer said, I just sold a few souls. And I was going to donate $10,000 to your building fund. So I was hoping to catch him. Immediately the secretary heard $10,000. She jumped up from her seat and, and, and said to the farmer on the phone, Oh, just a minute. Just a minute, sir. I think the big pig just walked in. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor one more time. I say, giving matters. In fact, giving really matters. That did you know Jesus spoke more about money than he spoke about heaven and hell combined? Did you know that? If you don't believe me, go read 29 of the parables that Jesus told. 16 of those parables are on money matters. The question is, what did Jesus talk about money like he did? Because he knows money matters. Jesus says, if you want to know a lot about somebody's, a person's priorities, where their priorities are, if you want to know something about a person's heart, what makes their heart beat fast where their heart is Jesus says take a look at where their money is going cause for where your treasure is there will your what also be your heart oh I, I know people